following Jonas, um, it, I, I am happy to introduce um, Joseph Thomas Jr. on this far side here. He has served as the director of the National Center for the Study of Children's Literature and teaches courses in a variety of areas um, at San Diego, San Diego State University, uh, including American literature, literature for young people, literary theory, and cultural studies. His scholarly and critical work focus, focuses on the intersection among 20th and 21st century poetry, the historical avant-garde, children's literature, childhood studies, image text studies, innovative slash intermedial art, and popular music, especially funk. <laughs> Um, and even opera, yeah. In addition to a handful of poems and some essays, um, Thomas has authored two books, Poetry's Playground, The Culture of Contemporary American Children's Poetry, the first book-length study on U.S. children's poetry, and Strong Measures. Alongside Kenneth Kidd, Thomas co-edited Prizing Children's Literature, the Cultural, the Cultural Politics of Children's Book Awards, his scholarly and practical interest in literary prizes began in 2005 when he co-founded the Lion and the Unicorn Award for Excellence in North American Poetry. He was appointed to the Lion and the Unicorn's inaugural poetry editor in 2013, a position he held until 2019. And Joseph's paper is entitled, Robert Graves, J.R.R. Tolkien, World War I and the 60s Counterculture. Um, thank you. I'm honored to uh, be here among such distinguished grave scholars. I uh, beg your indulgence as the essay I'll be reading you today is a long, admittedly digressive section of a considerably shorter piece. <laughs> uh, it begins a little something like this. Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien and Robert Graves both saw action as members of the British Army during the Great War, in which both were gravely injured. Their time during that woeful conflagration greatly influenced their po poetic sensibilities and inflamed their incipient interest in children and the folk and fairy tales so often associated with them. Tolkien explains that for him, a real taste for fairy stories was wakened by philology on the threshold of manhood and quickened to life, uh, to full life by war. Similarly, Michael Joseph suggests that for Graves, the traumas of the war and childhood are not merely interchangeable, they are indivisible, a single egg with two yolks. Although both saw success as professional writers during the first half of the 20th century, their reputations soared during the mid to late 1960s, when the countercultural movements in the United States and Europe adopted texts by both author authors as crucial parts of their back to nature ideology. As Alan Moore wrote of Tolkien, I read the Lord of the Rings trilogy in the 60s because that was kind of mandatory. You had to read the Lord of the Rings or you would have been, I don't know, thrown out of the counterculture or something like that. <laughs> As James C. Batari notes, hippies embraced Tolkien's vision because of his critique of materialism, its environmentalism, and anti-war stance. Likewise, Graves' The White Goddess, a historical grammar of poetic myth, was required reading for members of the growing Wicca movement, as well as hippies looking for new ways of conceptualizing gender and dethroning patriarchal, mystic, and religious systems. It is remarkable that by the 1960s, two 70-year-old poets who managed to survive the Great War when so many of their contemporaries were blotted from the pages of history also managed to create a body of work so incredibly relevant some 50 years after their wartime experiences. <laughs> One, Alston Anderson, Loverman. In Black Talk on the Move, a review of Loverman, a newly reissued collection of melancholy stories by Alston Anderson, originally pu published in 1959, Daryl Pinky positions Ander Anderson in relation to the black hipster of the 1940s and 50s, noting that the zoot-suited figures who show up at the end of Invisible Man correspond to Anderson's coming of age. 
They are the Hepcats whom, whom Claude Brown memorialized and Malcolm X had been. Not marginal, not unabsorbed, nonconformist. Alston Anderson was not a US citizen, yet he enlisted in 1943 and was sent to Germany and Iran and was later in Paris studying German metaphysics. There he began to write and met Mordecai Rickler, who may have pointed him towards Majorca. This would be Graves Majorca, or more specifically, Dea, the small coastal village which forms the northern ridge of the Spanish island, uh, island of Majorca, where Graves lived from 1929 until his death. In his review of Loverman, Pinckney notes, the white goddess was the backpack book of its day, and Anderson turned up in Majorca in the early 1950s, perhaps in search of Robert Graves. As we'll see, he was not alone, as Graves, and by extension, his home in Dea, was connected in several ways with music, drugs, and a general spirit of inquisitive mysticism. The Balearic Islands of Ibiza, uh, Formentera, and Majorca were the home of at least three flourishing hippie scenes in the 1960s. The community of artists and writers centered around Robert Graves and Dea, which attracted musicians such as Kevin Ayers, Robert Wyatt, and David Allen, the hedonistic hippies of Ibiza, and the more hardcore scene on Formentera that was filled with escapees from London and which had connections to Pink Floyd. But a decade before the action really started to boil, Anderson and Graves' friendship was just waxing as J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings was co first coming into print. And Graves would write the foreword to uh, Anderson's Lover Man. And by 1962, Anderson accepted that the life of apricots and yo yogurt was easier than, as he wrote to Graves in 1955, hanging out with juice heads and hop heads on the New York City waterfront. So Anderson moved back to Majorca by 1962. Two. Audrey Lord, the hippies of the gay girl scene. Just as hep cats like Anderson enjoyed graves, cool young women such as Audrey Lord found much to dig in Tolkien's seminal piece of high fantasy. Writing about her life between 1954 and 1956, again the period when the first three vol when the three volumes of the Lord of the Rings were first published in the United States, Lord explains, my friends and I were the hippies of the gay girl circuit before the word was coined. The White Goddess was initially published in 1948, but revised and enlarged editions were released in 52 and 61, right around the time the Lord of the Rings was finding its way into the backpacks of college students and hippies. And if the White Goddess was the backpack book of its day, as Pinckney suggests, it had a companion in the form of the Lord of the Rings. Here's Audrey Lord reminiscing about New Year's Eve, 1954. At a few minutes to midnight, we switched off the tinny portable photo and turned on the radio to hear the cheer go up in Times Square to greet 1955, even while we were saying how square that all was. Muriel gave me a copy of Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, an underground bestseller which she'd lifted, she said, from a Stanford bookstore. Then we all kissed each other and had some more wine. Three, soft machine. Musician Robert Wyatt, a major figure in the burgeoning jazz, fusion, psychedelia, and progressive rock scenes in England, was a great admirer of Robert, Robert Graves. He knew him from childhood, his folks' friends of the, of the Graves. And he remembers him as an awe-inspiring giant. Wyatt moved to Majorca in 1962 to study jazz with drummer George uh, Niedorf, who lived near Graves. During the 60s, Graves was, unlike Tolkien, doing considerable, a considerable amount of traveling from Mexico to Oxford to New York to Majorca, getting a taste of the age firsthand. Alston Anderson, Supra, was the only one was only one of a host of artists and hippies and witches and poets who'd visit Majorca to hobnob with graves and enjoy the environs. Wyatt recalls, you'd think, given his culture, if graves liked other arts besides poetry and prose, it would be classical music. But he in fact was a jazz fan, 
not just a jazz fan, but he really liked avant-garde pianist and composer Cecil Taylor. He'd heard Cecil Taylor in New York and had rushed up and embraced him at the piano on stage. He was so moved. Likewise, in 1968, just after the May 68 revolution in France, David Allen of the psychedelic pop group Soft Machine and his friend Gilly Smith, poet, professor of English at the Sorbonne and co-founder of, of the psychedelic rock band Gong, sought sanctuary in Majorca. Allen had first visited the island several years earlier with Robert Wyatt, who had introduced him to Robert Graves. Smith explains, Graves was part of an intense artistic community. He had an amphitheater in the grounds of his house where he would perform poetry. There were musicians and writers and artists who lived there, and lots of interesting visitors too, like Spike Milligan, Kenneth Tynan, and Sufi scholar Idrius Shah, and jazz saxophonist Didier Malherbe, whom they found living in a goat herder's cave on the island. It was very inspiring, Smith reflects. A source of that inspiration was uh, likely psilocybin mushrooms, a subject with which Graves was fascinated. Graves shared a deep and ranging correspondence with ethnomycologist, uh, botanist, anthropologist, and magic mushroom enthusiast R. Gordon Wasson. A correspondence that, it turned out, proved very useful to Wasson's scholarship. In fact, if you allow me to share someone else's anecdote, uh, while visiting Graves in Majorca, Michael Joseph, this guy with the camera here, noticed on Graves' bookshelves a copy of Wasson's seminal 1968 study, Soma, Divine Mushrooms of Immortality. Michael was also interested in mushrooms. Um, he had read Wasson himself, and we were, were all interested in mushrooms. Uh, so he thought to use the book to get a conversation going, and Michael can uh, correct the story in the Q&A if you're curious. Oh, I have this book, says Michael. Well, I wrote it, Graves replies. But the cover says, Michael offers, a little confused. I told him where to look, Graves concludes. <laughs> Which is to say, mushroom research and experimentation was not uncommon in Majorca. Both Soft Machine and Gong owed much of their absurd grooviness to psilocybin. According to Peter Watts, artists, writers, musicians, and actors from London would often visit graves, a crew that include Alan Lomax, the great musical folklorist, as well as Ronnie Scott, legendary British tenor saxophonist and proprietor and co-founder of Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club, where Graves was a regular visitor. Four, uh, William Graves, a bunch of hippies. Clearly, the psychedelia of the 1960s counterculture touched on the Graves household more profoundly than it did the home of Professor Tolkien. Of course, Tolkien received more than letters at his Oxford home. Oxford home. He also received calls, phone calls and social calls, the former often late at night, long distance, and the latter usually in the afternoon, long-haired visitors with sideburns and body odor and a distant, far away look in their eyes. As a rule, they were nice enough, but Tolkien didn't invite them in. Eventually, Tolkien had to leave the home he and his wife Edith had lived in for decades to get away from all the visiting hippies <laughs> uh, and, and Tolkien fans. Uh, but not so with Graves. Um, William's, William Graves' memoir, Wild Olives, redounds with stories of Graves hanging with the hippies. <laughs> Uh, William is Graves' son, and he reflects on this time when William, when his, when William was in his mid to late 20s uh, for the Robert Graves Oral History Project, a section of which appears revised and edited by Carl Hahn, this gentleman if I'm not mistaken, right, uh, and Michael Joseph and William Graves uh, in the Robert Graves Review, which you just heard about. Uh, Carl Hahn asks him, William, do you sense that Dea changed from a small Majorcan village to an international literary empire presided over by your father? To which William rep replies, no, because I don't think there was very many international writers there. 
they were a bunch of hippies. <laughs> Here he transforms the textured and diverse crew of artists and intellectuals to a kind of conservative stereotype. Uh, William explains with good humor, it, it appears, that to his father and his hippie friends, uh, William and his cadre, who rented the premises of a guest house and had a bar and restaurant as well as guests, had started to represent a sort of authoritarianism, fascism, these are his words, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Uh, this gives us the delightful picture of his 70-year-old Robert Graves rebelling against his 25-year-old son, <laughs> a son he would later um, appoint as executor of his literary estate. Five, escape from the horrors of the peace. Graves' children's poems are often read as an escape from the darkness of the war, but that commonplace oversimplifies something much more complex and nuanced. As Michael Joseph joked during a conversation last week, Graves didn't turn to fairy tales in children's literature as an escape from the horrors of war. Rather, it was, a, it was an escape from the horrors of the peace. This position is quite different from John Garth's opinion that Robert Graves pictured the simultaneous arrival of maturity and war as the obliteration of fairy and fairyland. As evidence, Garth points to Graves' Babylon, published in 1916, Goliath and David. Uh, William made him old and wary, banishing the lords of fairy. She, she uh, scattered to the hedges and ditches all our nursery gnomes and witches. None of the magic hosts, none remain, but a few ghosts. Uh, but Graves would later remove, remove Babylon from his collected poems. And uh, what Garth goes on to say about Tolkien, by way of contrast with, with Graves, actually applies equally to, to both Graves and Tolkien. Uh, Garth writes, this was more than metaphor. Fairy came close to vanishing altogether during the First World War, thanks to this associative confusion of the pre-war era, childhood, and fairy tales. Yet Tolkien did not regard fairies as childish, and he was not writing nursery tales, but an epic history of the world through fairy eyes. And sure, Tolkien did, did not regard fairy tales as inherently childish. After the war, Tolkien did write a great deal about his dissatisfaction with the candy floss fairylands of Victorian England. Like Tolkien, Graves did not leave fairyland behind after the war, but continued, continued writing for and about children throughout his life. Of course, the attention uh, he paid to childhood and his literatures over his life is too often forgotten by those writing about his life and work. More attention is paid, of course, to his war poems, but even those are often inflected by the war and his experience of it. In Orphans of Poetry, Michael Joseph explains, but what makes Graves' writing about childhood and four children particularly fascinating is the extent to which he sought to radically reinterpret, even reinvent, his own childhood, replacing the Victorian childhood he rejected as a part of the all that to which the title of his autobiography, Goodbye to All That, refers, uh, with one that more conformed to a, to, that what will to, uh, with, he wanted to replace that with one that conformed more closely to his experience in the trenches and his intuitions as a poet. That was all Michael there. Uh, Tolkien, too, became suspicious of the tropes and associations accompanying the predominant Victorian notions of fairyland. And although some of his early children's work participates in these very tropes, by the publication of The Hobbit in 1937, he distanced himself from the flower and butterfly minuteness typical of depictions of fairy and fairyland in the late 1800s, early 20th century. This minuteness, Tolkien maintained, was the product of rationalization, a point of view shared by Graves, who, after all, was the champion of poetic unreason. And according to Tolkien, it transformed the glamour of Elfland into mere finesse and invisibility into a fragility that could hide in a cowslip or shrink behind a blade of grass. Both understood that in 1915, fairy was a troubled concept in an increasingly troubled term. 
John Barth reminds, quote, Tolkien's old King Edward school teacher, R.W. Reynolds, soon warned him that the title he proposed for his volume of verse, The, Trump, the uh, Trumpets of Fairy, was a little precious. The word fairy had become rather spoiled of late. Reynolds was thinking, perhaps, not uh, of recent trends in fairy writing, but of the use of fairy to mean homosexual, which dated from the mid 1890s. Garth stretches, uh, stresses rather, that Tolkien's affection for fairy, if not its Victorian prettiness, was shared by Robert Graves, who entitles his 1917 collection Fairies and Fusiliers, with no pun apparently intended. Uh, both Tolkien and Graves, along with many of their compeers in the service, had been weaned on Andrew Lang's fairy tale anthologies and original so stories, such as uh, George MacDonald's The Princess and the Goblin, and fairy stock had surged with the success of Peter Pan, in a story of adventure and eternal youth that, had, that now had, this is during the time of the war, additional uh, relevance for boys on the thresh threshold of manhood facing battle. And it was their complex relation to fairy stories and myth, unironic yet deeply complex and textured, that made them so resonant with the idealism of the 60s counterculture. Tom Shippey writes, Tolkien as a philologist and also an infantry veteran was deeply conscious of the strong continuity between that heroic world and the modern one. So too with graves, their dedication to the complexity of childhood, the power of an unironic treatment of fairy, and their profound appreciation of darkness and light within both made these unlikely septuagenarians central to youth culture. Graves from the inside, Tolkien decidedly from without. Mm -hmm. Thank you.